grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, the 8th verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Your brothers and sisters in Christ. About 300 years before Jesus, Alexander the Great was leading a campaign all across Asia Minor. He was a successful young general and nothing was stopping him. Nobody was getting in his way. In fact, his army marched all the way to the Himalaya mountains past the known maps of the time. And when his generals got to the, the front of, or the base of those mountains, they turned around with concern and went to Alexander and said, we have a problem here. We've marched all the way off the map. We should really go back to what we know. Well, as Alexander listened to this and considered this, he responded by saying, you know, mediocre armies stay within where they know. But truly great armies march off the map. You know, Alexander's not the only general, the only conqueror to give this command. Our Lord Jesus, who conquered death, issues a similar command to you and to me today. And as we study God's word together, we see that he holds this command out for us, not so that we can conquer lands by the sword, but rather through the good news of salvation. This morning, he gives us that encouragement to march off the map. But before sounding this order, before he tells us to go marching off the map, he makes us a promise. He says in our lesson today, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Let's just stop for a moment and think what a difference it makes to be a Spirit-led army or to be a Spirit-led church. Because the fact is, Jesus has promised power to his church. And with that power comes something that is able to accomplish things. You see, by, by ourselves, according to our own way of thinking, we look at the Word of God and we think it's not all that powerful. It can't really do a whole lot. We underestimate what it can accomplish. But he says to us, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I want you to think about Jesus' disciples for a moment. This lesson comes right as Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. Those disciples had been with Jesus for three years. They witnessed all the miracles. They even saw him rise from the dead. Over the course of the last 40 days, he's making it crystal clear who he is, what he's accomplished. And these disciples still had their minds set on earthly glory. They still weren't quite understanding what Jesus' purpose was. They say to him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, without the Holy Spirit, that's you and me. We don't understand on our own what the purpose of the gospel is. We don't understand on our own what the purpose of our church is. We don't understand on our own what God can accomplish. And so that's why he says, you are going to be a spirit-led church. I'm going to give you the gospel. I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can go and take that gospel to all nations. I want you to march forth as the church that you are. I want you to march forth as a spirit-led church because then you will see what I can accomplish. You see, our commander promises us the Holy Spirit. He tells us, this is what I'm going to give you in order to ensure that my mission is carried out. You need the Holy Spirit because otherwise, we would be much like those disciples. 
Because remember, at Jesus' resurrection, those disciples were locked behind closed doors, cowering in fear. Sometimes we do that too, don't we? We cower in fear because of all the threats that are out there. The disciples were cowering in fear because they saw what had been done to their Lord and Master and feared this might happen to us as well. We cower in fear because, sure, there are those external pressures. But I'm guessing that more than likely our fear comes from internal pressures, internal fears. What if what I say to that person makes them angry? What if what I say to that person, he just flat out rejects me? What if I embarrass myself? What if I embarrass my Savior? What if I do more damage now with what I say than where that person was to begin with? And so we have this fear of saying the wrong thing, of doing something that is going to do more damage than good. But Jesus says, I, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes up. And it's an amazing power that he has given us. It's an amazing power that has worked in our own hearts and lives. And he says, this is what I give to you as my church. Think of that power that we see in action as we carry the gospel to all people. We see the power at the baptismal font. When that water splashes on the head of that child or even on the head of an adult, that person is brought from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. We see power when we gather side by side with our fellow Christians at the altar. Power that brings body and blood together with bread and wine through the word of God. We see power on display when we hear those words. As a called servant of Christ, by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, as a spirit-led church, we see the power that God puts at our disposal because it's not our power, it's his. And he says, this spirit-led church that you are, your marching orders are clear. Go march off the map and take the gospel to all people. But as a spirit-led church, there's also another aspect that he has in mind for us. He also wants us to be a risk-taking church. To do things that push the edge just a little bit. I want you to think back to those disciples. He told them, you will be my witnesses. You will be the ones to take the good news to other people. And to be a witness requires taking a little risk. Again, you think about when Jesus gave this command. And just ten days later, we're going to see his command, his marching orders, start producing some of that that he expects. You see, the disciples 50 days earlier had been cowering behind closed doors and then the day of Pentecost comes. The city of Jerusalem is filled with people. And what do Peter and the rest of the disciples do? But they stand up and they confront this crowd and say, you're the ones that crucified Jesus. tried and tortured and abused and abandoned and banished and finally even executed. It was a risk to share the good news and yet God made them a risk-taking church. God worked in their hearts because he knew the power was not in them but was in the word that he had given them. And so he says, you are going to be my witnesses, and you are to be this risk-taking church. You are to go out there and to proclaim that gospel, no matter what may come. He tells us today, I want you 
to be a risk-taking church, to get outside of your comfort zone and be ready to share the good news of Jesus. It's kind of built into us, I think, a little bit. To be suspicious of someone who doesn't quite look like us, who doesn't quite talk like us. And yet God says, I want you to take a risk. I want you to take a risk and share the good news with someone who doesn't look like you or who doesn't talk like you because every single soul is precious. And every single soul needs to hear the good news of salvation because without it, that soul is lost. And so I want you to take some risks. And we're doing that, aren't we? We do that by sharing the good news with other people that don't look like us or talk like us, who don't come from the same background as us. And God says, when you take risks, I reward you. We're doing that in our church body today. We have churches who have started ministries among the Vietnamese people, the Hmong, the Sudanese. People that don't necessarily look like the congregation where that started. Sometimes those groups have marched right through the front door just begging to be served. Was it a risk to serve these people? Absolutely. Was it a risk to take that gospel and to step outside the comfort zone in order to try and serve them? Absolutely. Was it a risk to take time and spend money on something like this? Absolutely. One of the neat things our synod is doing is something called the Pastoral Studies Institute. It's meeting people from different cultures where they're at and coming up with a new way to train these people. To train these people who are from a different background. So that now God has blessed them so that these men, some of which have become pastors in our city, working in our communities or even being sent throughout the United States and some even going back to their homelands to share the gospel. Was it a risk? Absolutely. But what are the results? Thousands of people are now hearing the gospel who hadn't heard it before. You see, God wants us to be that risk-taking church. He says, you will be my witnesses. He says, it's not an option. It's not negotiable. It is something that we won't opt out of because he says, you will be my witnesses. Because that's what the world needs. A spirit-led church who is a risk-taking church who is speaking the gospel as his witnesses. It's kind of interesting when you look at that word witness. The Greek word for it is the same word that we get the word martyr from. Someone who is not afraid to share his faith and in fact die for his faith. That's what we've been called to do, is to be those witnesses, to be those martyrs who will stand on the solid truth of God's word and share it, no matter what the risk is. But you know, now here's where the fun part comes in. Because God has called us to be this church, this spirit-led church, that is also to be a reproducing church. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Again, almost immediately we see this taking action, this bringing fruits about. Ten days after this order, Peter stands up on Pentecost, and there are people there from all over the world, from Arabia and Africa and Italy and Greece, and he speaks the gospel. 3,000 are added to their number in one single day because the Word of God works. 3,000 are added to their number and the Word begins to spread. Shortly after this, the Apostle Paul started going to the known world of Mediterranean world, sharing the gospel wherever he went. The other disciples' tradition has dispersed all over the world, into India, into France, into Germany, and everywhere. 
gospel. And what happened? The church became a reproducing church. The church began producing more believers. It still happens today, doesn't it? If you want to talk about what our Jerusalem is, it's our family. It's our neighborhood. It's our community. When a mother sings, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, to her little baby, that's the church being the reproducing. <laughs> when the pastor announce, announces that your sins are forgiven, that's the reproducing church. When we send young people out to different parts of the world to teach English as a second language, and they wear their faith on their sleeves, taking the opportunity to witness, that's the church being a reproducing church. When you have a grandfather on his deathbed saying to his grandchildren, Today I'm going to be with this, my Savior forever. That's the church being a reproducing church. When we put our services on the internet, when services are produced in Spanish when, and sent out throughout the world, that's the church taking risks and being a reproducing church. When our church body starts producing materials in other languages, our Wells multi-language publication services, when that starts to happen so that the good news of salvation is translated into other languages, that's the church being the reproducing church. You see, God has called us, has given us our marching orders. He says, I want you to take the gospel wherever you go. But you're not alone in this endeavor because you are a spirit-led church. I have given you my power through my word. You are a risk-taking church. Given the courage to step outside your own comfort zone and speak to people you don't know. To take the good news in Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. That calls you to be a reproducing church. May God give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom to be that church that marches off the map, taking the gospel wherever we go. Yeah. Please stand. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We can